Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, and we'll plan it. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technologies, services, and products that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And of course, as we add two billion new people, yes, two billion new people to the planet, how are we gonna be able to provide them the food, the fuel, the fiber, all the basic infrastructure that they need? We have someone sitting right beside me who's actually been very active in really addressing all these issues, but from an area right outside of Washington, D.C., and within the surrounding counties. This is uh, James R. Foster. He goes by Jim. He's uh, LEED AP certified. We'll ask him what that means in a minute. President of the Anacostia Watershed Society. And uh, Jim, welcome back to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Sam. Glad nice to, to have you with us. I think the work that you're doing is fantastic. You've added Lee a LEED AP to your uh, your uh, considerable titles there. What is LEAD AP? And then we'll get into the Anacostia Watershed. Sure, just quickly, it's leadership in energy and environmental design. And uh, it's really about a process, uh, sort of like total quality management of, hey, did you think about this in the design phase and, uh, of a project? I think it's absolutely fantastic that you're doing that because the LEAD AP is you know, internationally famous and sought right. after and glad you've done that. But tell us a little bit about the Anacostia Watershed Society, its vision, and its mission. Sam, so we are working to restore the Anacostia River. We're very uh, uh, focused on that. Uh, our mission is uh, fishable and swimmable by 2025. And uh, we're really uh, thinking we're making a lot of progress in that respect. Uh, you know, we've got several things uh, separating us from success, but uh, a lot of those are in uh, uh, some uh, underway in some manner. So we're very excited about that. I think it's absolutely fantastic the work you're doing. And uh, many people may know when we talked about this a couple of years ago is that the draft of the Anacostia River when uh, settlers first came here and Native Americans were living around there was about 28 feet, I understand. Now it's down to about two feet. That's and uh, so you're, you're just doing a tremendous work to turn that around. And uh, it really is a lot of work, too. Absolutely, thank you so much for saying that. But the reality is it's a group effort. Uh, we've got great leadership, and uh, I think we've got everybody's attention now, and they're focused like a laser beam on making this happen. Now, talking about all the changes coming on, all the work that needs to be done, but you know, the literally hundreds of thousands of hours have been put in to really turn this uh, river around and take it from uh, just a slow moving stream to where it's something that's you know, really significant within the community. What's some of the best practices, Jim, that you've learned over these years, both from the standpoint of environmental, but also you're very much involved in community development at the same time? You know, it's a great question. The, the reality is, is uh, you have to learn from others and you can't just uh, take uh, you know, and start and go, how did this happen to us? So we've got a long and sorted history along the Anacostia there. Uh, we uh, t tr typically treated the river like a sewer and dumped everything in it. And uh, I'm just hoping people in other places around the world can learn from our mistakes and uh, mm -hmm. short circuit that. But, uh, you know, now we're, we're uh, taking care of the sins of the father. Yeah, I tell you, and the whole good thing about this is that you really, you, you want to share about the best practices because you have people literally from all over the world now coming in to view this. And of course, in a sense, the world comes to Washington, D.C. as the capital of the United States. And it really is an opportunity to show off best practices. And so how do you categorize those and how do you uh, get that information out besides being on Emerald Planet TV uh, about these best practices? Sure. So um, the we, we kind of put things into little buckets. We've got stormwater, we've got uh, trash, we have uh, sewage, and uh, legacy toxic sediments in the river bottom. And we kind of are trying to uh, go at each one of those in their own little silo, but the reality is it's all interconnected. What we really need is the million people that are living in this small watershed to understand what these issues are and how, if we can get around them, uh, we can make so much more progress together as a community with 
with in, uh, inter integrating public health, integrating the economy, mm -hmm. and uh, a river is really a reflection of the community that it drains. So if the river is dirty, the community above it must be dirty as well. Yeah. Looking at this, I, want, I left this up purposely because we're going through some of the slides that you provided for us. Tell us about the importance of volunteers and uh, the actual numbers that you have on a year-to-year -year basis coming out and helping sure. as far as the watershed is concerned. So it's really critical to uh, the work that we do to engage uh, the community. Our tactics are educate, demonstrate, and engage. Can you, one more time. Educate, demonstrate and engage. That's fantastic, and, great motto. And, and it's really, um, you can't build a foundation of support in the community if you don't educate them, if you don't get them out there showing them, hey, this stuff really works, and then engage them in something so that they can take some ownership. And it works best, you see it with kids. And uh, so we work with about 3,000 kids a year, uh, service project, mm -hmm. uh, going into the classroom, working with them, and uh, then getting them out on the river to see the river and uh, make the connection, because most of them go, wait, I live here, and that's over there. And, and once you connect it, they, they bing, the light goes off. Yeah, and I know you work with uh, Boy Scouts, 4-H, there's a whole number of youth organizations that you actually work with, but also you have a number of adult organizations you work with, communities of faith and others. How do you get the encouragement out to the adults and make them feel comfortable coming in and doing the things that we're seeing right here as far as going out and uh, you know doing the cleanups and and helping to expand uh, the general welfare if you will of the watershed yeah well it's uh, of course trying to get uh, people to get to understand people well enough to understand what their issues are and how it can benefit them. So uh, perhaps it's a, uh, an incentive program to put a vegetated roof on a building. Perhaps it's an opportunity to construct a, uh, a rain garden or other type of uh, conservation landscape on their property to enhance their property. Um, sometimes it's just, hey, come out in a boat and, and uh, come and see it. Yeah, which I'm going to be doing with you hopefully uh, very soon. surely yes uh, that's, this spring. that's a good thing I really love to do that uh, looking at what some of the skills the talents and the energy that you're able to bring from not just your staff but also from the community itself this vast pool of resources that you have yeah we're really blessed to live in a uh, community of uh, just so many uh, very passionate and um, people, group of people that uh, care about the community, care about their uh past and their future and their children's future. So we really try to say, look, I'm not doing this for myself, I'm doing this for the kids. And uh, what's this world going to be like uh, for our children and for their children's children? So I think when you start to touch some of those uh, you know, live wires, people, people stand up and they get it and they go, oh, okay. We have worked so hard in this country to disconnect people from their environment. They get in their air-conditioned car and they, mm -hmm. from their air-conditioned house, drive to their air-conditioned drive-in to get their you know, coffee and then to get their drive-in at breakfast and their drive-in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just insanity uh, what we've done. So we really need to try to reconnect people to the natural environment around us. Well, something I can say, which is really true, is that people in the community, I mean, throughout this very broad community, Washington, D.C., Southern Maryland, Northern uh, Virginia, uh, really do know you and the organization. It's very well respected. So how do you get the, the leadership from the organization that goes across? Because you have literally hundreds of different collaborators that are working with you across you know, many different communities. How do you provide that leadership? And what is the effort that it takes to keep that energy and that focus and that um, willingness to contribute? Yeah. It's difficult. It is. Um, it's it's hard to sustain because uh, we all live in a very uh, you know minute by minute type world of you know squirrel, mm -hmm. and uh, so so it is difficult to sustain. But um, you know it's the right thing to do, and that's really I think that when you, you you get down to brass tacks, it's a moral obligation, and I think that people who are understanding that they need to uh, help contribute to the solution rather than make up more problems uh, really come out and shine. 
Yeah. Looking at this photograph here, I, many people would say, oh, God, that's a bad thing. You've got these power lines over that. But actually, you can take these, uh, these open areas and really convert it into something that's very useful as far as, you know, these areas are concerned. Sure. How so do you use this, uh, which is really a, you're repurposing land that's being used for yeah. something totally different? Sam, the Anacostia watershed is an urban, the Anacostia is an urban river. The watershed is urbanized. Uh, we've got a, a million people living in 106, 176 square miles, uh, over 5,000 people density. Our communities are designed around the automobile, so we're about 25% of the land mass is hardened with roads and parking lots and buildings and such. Um, what we need to do is make all of our natural areas as efficient and effective as we can. So just because there's a power line going through there doesn't mean that the ground below it isn't uh, useful for other things. Now, they don't want trees growing there, so hey, guess what? Let's, let's grow a meadow there. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, when, when Europeans first came here, there was 2,500 acres of, 2,500 uh, acres of tidal wetland. Mm -hmm. Today there's 125. Oh my gosh. So we've just amazing. completely destroyed the wetlands. We didn't know any better. We mm -hmm. were ignorant. Um, and so today I need my wetlands to be as efficient and effective as they can be. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this, I want to put this back up. We're just about running out of time, which always happens when we're Absolutely. chatting about all this. But looking at these different plants, you're really focused on uh, native species. I mean, they are where they are because, you know, they've adapted and are, it's in many ways, the best uh, that you can have there. What are we looking at here and why is it important to have these native species instead of what we call invasive spe species or foreign species? Right. So our ecology is really closely bound. We can't uh, just say, you know, we, we're going to have uh, turf fields everywhere and we're going to be able to be as efficient and effective mm -hmm. uh, in our natural areas. So if you look at this slide, the uh, first um, column all the way to the left shows uh, typical uh, fescue uh, grass. And what, what this is really showing is the depth of roots into the soil and how deep and how well those roots bind. And as you can see, that first uh, uh, pictures of uh, this fescue, and it's only about five inches deep in the, into the soil there. So what we're really saying is uh, it's not anywhere near as effective at uh, managing soil, taking up the nutrients from the soil, and holding it in place. So these other plants uh, have grown up here. They're part of an ecosystem that everything's related. The animals that eat those plants, uh, the bees that carry the nectars and the, the pollen around, mm -hmm. uh, everything's connected. When you in, bring in something invasive that is from someplace else, uh, it doesn't provide the, the, the right habitat, it doesn't provide food, it doesn't help. Well, we only have about 10 seconds. Yes, what sir. do you see for the growth of the Anacostia Watershed Society? We're going to clean up this river, uh, Anacostia Watersheds. It isn't about AWS, it's about the Anacostia, uh, and we're very excited about the future. Fantastic. This is uh, Jim Foster, uh, lead AP, president of Anacostia Watershed Society. And thank you for being with us as we talk about this very important issue that's really global as we create the Emerald Planet. Smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about me. Nothing very nice. My holy smile. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution.
Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, technologies, services, products, and of course the people are providing the leadership to enact, enhance, innovate, and to sustain all these uh, various uh, types of technology, services, and products that we're finding in over 144 different nations. And how are we going to improve the, uh, the economy and the environment at the same time when we're adding 2 billion new people? Yes, 2 billion new people to the planet by 2050. So it's estimated they'll have about 9 billion people on the planet all competing for these natural resources and the infrastructure that's needed to take care of all this. And have a gentleman who's actually thinking about, but uh, for a number of years, been doing good things about this. This is James, goes by Jim R. Foster. Uh, lead AP, president of the Anacostia Watershed Society. And we're going to be talking about something that uh, is really new for us to discuss, Jim, the saving our native grasslands called song. I really like this. And that's what prompted me to say, hey, we got to get Jim back on Emerald Planet TV. But tell us a little bit about the uniqueness of the Anacostia Watershed Society because it does stand out among all of many other uh, active nonprofits. And then why did you set up the SONG program? Great, Th Sam, thanks for having me. Glad to um, have you here. SONG is really a way of uh, connecting uh, kids to their environment. Um, we have a uh, program where we want to recreate some uh, native grasslands. Uh, grasslands are really important uh, part of our ecology, and uh, we really need to uh, bring some of them back. People naturally think plant trees at this point, so we're, we're working through that, but uh, there's a lot of the uh, e ecology that depends upon uh, these grasslands where birds can, uh, uh, certain birds can live, and uh, it's their habitat, and uh, these uh, uh, other animals eat those plants that are there and such. So it's it's different from a forest, but it's uh, and it's not a tidal wetland mm -hmm. either. Yeah, and this is something that uh, many people are shocked to hear that the Native Americans for literally thousands of years were burning out the forest, bringing in grasslands because they wanted you know the the deer and and the buffalo and other things to be able to graze, and they realized that they needed that. So in many ways, when we're reinstituting these grasslands, we're really going back to you know what some of the ecology had been for you know at least hundreds and maybe thousands of years uh, before the European societies came here. But tell us a little bit about the uniqueness of the Anacostia watershed. Watershed, you know, I want to define that term, society. What is a watershed? and what sets you apart? Sure, so a watershed is a, uh, the geographic area in which all the rainfall flows to a common place. Mm -hmm. So our watershed is about 176 square miles mm -hmm. in eastern Washington, D.C., western Prince George's County, and eastern Montgomery County in Maryland. It's really a Maryland river. About 80% of the watershed is in Maryland. And it's been highly urbanized. We were developed uh, uh, you know, from 1607, pretty much. but. Uh, the, the society's grown up around trying to restore this river. It was called the Forgotten River because people just, uh, because of the sins of the Father, we, we, were, we, we dumped everything in the river, the sewage, all the waste. We thought it would just carry it away and just dis disappear. Well, the world's getting to be smaller, and so that waste we dump in here ends up in the ocean, and it's washing up on other people's beaches, and it's just not the right thing to do. Well, and the whole thing, too, is that it was a very active river, so there were a lot of manufacturing along
along that almost for 400 years that you know the first settlers came here and then uh, also the many of the shipbuilding was a big industry along all that so there's many things that were dumped into that many chemicals and of course now that you know when we got to World War One World War Two uh, many more chemicals were invented and, and ended up in the river at the same time yeah I like to draw uh, the Civil War as the real turning point for the Anacostia uh, it was really only about 8,000 people living in Washington up till then. There were no sewer facilities. You know, it was, it was a very sleepy little town. Um, and the Civil War came, uh, 50,000 Union troops came here. Mm -hmm. They cut down all the trees for 50 miles, or 25 miles, mm -hmm. to build this circle of forts around Washington, right. D.C. And then the Navy Yard became probably one of the largest industrial complexes on the East Coast. And all their waste, of course, was pushed into the river. Yeah. Now, uh, we, we were talking a little earlier about, you know, the forest. We tend to think of forest and, you know, this is a way to restore, you know, uh, for the environment and all that. But you're saying we have to have this mix between wetlands, grasslands, and the forest. So how is the, the grasslands different from the wetlands and the forest? And then how do they really mutually uh, become compatible with each other, and one really depends on the ecosystem for the other. Yeah, it, it's it's really not that separate when you when you look at it from the big picture. Um, you, you know, you've got the, the from in the water coming up into the wetlands, into the upland, uh, into the forest, and such. So it's it's really all connected. This is just an integral part of it, where uh, you've got an open field, you've got different types of grasses, different types of animals that are uh, able to graze there. So, for instance, you know, the prairie in the central part of the country was huge. Of buffalo, millions and millions of buffalo ro roam there. So, but today, uh, you know, what we're looking for is a balance in our urban ecology. We're looking for native plants to uh, thrive. We're looking for the animals that have been here to thrive. Uh, and you know, we just have a pair of bald eagles back on the Anacostia River, first time in 70 years. That's that's yeah. absolutely amazing. Of course, uh, something I'm very familiar with is along the James River. The, I think they have one or two nesting pairs, and uh, now I think it's over 100 right. nesting pairs up oh, and down the James. River, so uh, this is something that's really important, and it is possible to do all these things. That's they have sturgeon too, and I'm I'm on my way to get sturgeon back here. Oh, you know, that that would be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Looking at uh, meadowlands, you know, this is again an, another uh, native environment. Why is this restoration work so important when you're looking at it? Going back to your term, this broad scheme as far as environmental improvement and also restoration projects. Yeah, so. It's part of a system that you know helps uh, balance out the ecology. It's part of the system that was here, uh, and and the animals and the plants that are here now are, are need that uh, environment to thrive and to be efficient and effective in how they're managing their part of the ecology. So you know we we have uh, we, very briefly we have. Uh, uh, we were a huge part of the Atlantic Flyway for many years, and we had a lot of uh, migratory birds coming through here. Well, they would stop here because it was tidal wetland. They would eat a lot of the uh, 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 wild rice and, and other plants there and move on. Well, then we brought, uh, after we hunted them almost to extinction, we brought geese here, and then they became resident geese and, and didn't travel. So it threw our ecology out of balance. And it's the same with the plants and the trees that, you know, you you have to have a certain mix to, you know, really have a sustainable uh, way forward for the ecology. Looking, the looking at uh, the pollinators, the uh, monarch butterfly for one of those things that travels from Nova Scotia up in Canada all the way down to uh, the central part of Mexico. Uh, how does that fit into the schema of restoring some of these uh, meadowlands and sure. uh, the native? Because they need milkweed. Uh, that's what they really feed on. Uh, yet uh, through agriculture, in most cases, we're trying to get rid of milkweed. So how do we bring that delicate balance back into being? It's very difficult. We have this most amazing uh, monarch butterfly, and they're just completely under siege because, mm -hmm. again, we have taken out uh, just very basic milkweed and said, that's a, that's a weed. Mm -hmm. It must be. It's bad. But it's, it's really uh, uh, the, base, the base of that uh, monarch's uh, 
food mm -hmm. to to uh, you know come and be here uh, you know in that uh, in the area here. So again, the milkweed won't grow in a forest. Mm -hmm. It won't grow in a tidal wetland. So it needs to be there in the in a marsh in a uh, a meadow. I'm sorry. In a meadow. Yeah. yeah. And looking at that too, you know, it's a pollinator, and right. many people say it's it's beautiful. We love having it, but they don't realize that it actually brings us the food that we eat. And I'll, how do you balance that as far as the bees, bats, all these other uh, animals that we really need and depend on, as far as uh, being able to keep the food growing and expanding the food base. It's a, it's a huge challenge. Sam, you know, when I ask people, where does our water come from, they go, the tap. You know, where does food come from, the convenience store? And, and so they're really disconnected. They understand that, you know, if, if we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have food. Mm -hmm. End of discussion. So uh, here in the district, we're really looking at very small opportunities, uh, vegetated rooftops, for instance, and building uh, connectivity on the rooftops for birds and pollinators and such to, you know, across the this city. This is the green roof concept. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. To cross the city and, and have space there where, you know, they, they can do their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a lot more uh, people coming to do to coming to beekeeping and uh, understand the importance of it and also to get honey. Yeah. Well, and the whole thing too is that 80% of the population in the United States is now urbanized. And we think of America, you know, wide open spaces and all that, but really we're a very urbanized country, very concentrated in many ways. And so incorporating these urban areas into this whole natural scheme is a very important accent that's not just important. It's critical that we critical. do it. Absolutely. And, and we are, um, I think, Understanding that industrial agriculture is um, not completely compatible with uh, the ways that, uh, of the world and sustainability. So for instance, there's a small uh, urban farm just uh, up, up the river from my office in Bladensburg called Eco City Farm. <clears throat> And they're very intensely growing a lot of food there. Uh, they sell it to the restaurants. It's all organic, but it's a real balance. They've got uh, ducks and they've got chickens and fruit trees and uh, vermiculture. They're taking food waste from the communities there. And uh, it's very intensive, but it's year round and they're doing a fabulous job. But it's going to be those kinds of things, uh, you know, a thousand of those that have come along to, to fix the thousand uh, cuts. You mentioned earlier you have students involved. What types of students do you have coming in? Out, and how do they know, how do they become involved, and how can you get the teachers, K-12, professors at the university and colleges? Yeah. So we, uh, I have, I'm so blessed with a great staff of educators uh, that, that really are very well connected. Uh, we have been working for years to integrate environmental education into the curriculum already existing that people are working to do, the math, the biology, things of that nature. So we just want to try to shift it around a little bit and give people an experience outside. So in Maryland, we have a No Child Left Inside, and uh, we really program and we, where we're really trying to connect kids with the outdoors. So we have an environmental education mm -hmm. requirement for graduation from high school. And so we are providing those uh, real-time experiential learning things in, uh, out into the uh, environment. Get Jim, last question. Saving our uh, native grasslands, what do you see for the expansion? 5, 10, 15 years, and we've got about 10 seconds. I see getting a, a, a more robust uh, meadows in several different places, uh, habitat for birds and animals and pollinators. This is Jim Fox. Foster, the Anacostia uh, Watershed Society. Thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. What's wrong with this picture? 
Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm, fashion, flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we're looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices. And at the same time, we look in our own local community as far as the best practices and what is here that we can actually share around the globe. I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who's uh, very much involved in uh, innovation and sustainability, resiliency, all these uh, buzzwords that's going on today as far as how do we improve the environment and the economies at the same time. This is Dr. Uh, Peter I. May, who is an environmental scientist and uh, restoration ecologist in Biohabitats, Inc. And we're glad to have you on the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. It's good to be here. Welcome. And also, you're a professor at the University of Maryland, which yes, is I the, there, yeah. the uh, land grant university for Maryland and a very fine institution. So, we have good things to say about that. Uh, tell us a little bit of, to our domestic international viewers something about your organization, Biohabitats Inc., which is actually a for profit organization. Yes, yes. It's a, um, it's a company that is um, tailored to uh, conservation, planning, uh, ecological engineering. Um, regenerative design. We restore ecosystems and we also restore systems that involve the human built environment with the natural world together so they can uh, live together better and function better for the benefit of uh, society and nature. Most people think of the United States as uh, wide open areas. That's the image that we have. We try to perpetuate that even in advertisements and and all that, whether we're selling you know, soft drinks or automobiles, airplanes or whatever. We see these wide open expanses. But really, that, we're not that anymore. We're an 80% urbanized uh, society. Uh, we're growing uh, one of the few, you know, uh, Western-oriented uh, societies that constantly is expanding its right. base through immigration and other things. So you're talking about this delicate balance where you're trying to build these ecosystems, but in a very urban environment. So right. how do you think about and how do you conceive looking at urban areas and saying, hey, this we need to incorporate this into a comprehensive environmental ecosystem? Well, you really need to be a systems thinker and uh, somebody who looks at the big picture. Um, you know, reductionist thinking, thinking down into the very small, that's something that um, really is, is, is from past millennia, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And so now we're thinking bigger and we're incorporating uh, the human built environment uh, in, in urban ecosystems and how can we uh, incorporate the best of nature and encourage natural systems in urban environments, and that's really um, that's really part of what we do. Humans are a part of our uh, ecosystem, um, a very important one. We need to recognize that and not set them aside. Um, of course, there's places for uh, mm -hmm. for purely natural ecosystems, but like you said, as of a few years ago, the majority of human population on the planet is now living in urban environments and not out in the countryside anymore. Looking at the flora and fauna, you know, which is the, the broad expanse as far as, you know, in essence, the, the majority of the species, mm -hmm. even though human beings think we, there were most 
you know, uh, dynamic population on the planet, but you know, plants and insects and animals and all that really are. But the Anacostia River, which is what really is bringing us together right. in the watershed uh, society, what what is there that we need to have at the same time accounting for human beings and the impact that 400 years of development and now very rapid uh, economic growth within the Washington capital region. Right. Well, as Jim had said, we have a you know a relatively small uh, uh, watershed with a lot of people over a million people, and so uh, we need to recognize that. And there need to be there needs to be organizations like the Anacostia Watershed Society that uh, really rally uh, people to the cause of not only growth and development, but um, but really uh, protecting, enhancing, restoring those systems that we've lost lost over time when we weren't really thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, AWS really focuses the, uh, the our collective attention and reminds us all that there's uh, there's more to be spoken for here than, um, than just development. We need to uh, develop and redevelop, restore our uh, ecosystems to have that balance. Now you're talking about Jim Foster, who's the president of the uh, Anacostia Watershed Society. How do you actually work with a nonprofit mm -hmm. being a for-profit, and yet, it seems like it's almost seamless between what you're doing and what they're doing. How do you do that? Well, I also live in the watershed and uh, have made it a piece of my life. Uh, I actually did a lot of research on the Anacostia, so I have a personal interest as well. And I've decided to devote a percentage of my time towards helping them um, as a technical advisor. And then also occasionally professionally, um, when they solicit our help on uh, engineering restoration jobs, um, we might help them out as well, but I'm, I'm, um, uh, you know, I, I feel that living in the watershed, um, you need to lead by an example. And uh, if I have a skill, then I like to, uh, 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 you know, impart it and, and provide it to uh, the watershed society. So I don't see any incompatibility there. And and at Biohabitats, we are all of our, a lot of my colleagues there are, are um, uh, uh, very active and involved. I mean, we we live what we do, and uh, and we we give back. Now, looking at the uh, the song project, and this is something that the Anacostia Watershed Society is is created, and probably with your help and leadership involved in all that. But also, it's encouraging youth, and we see a number of them here that are involved. What is song? And then, how do you encourage and reach out to youth so that they want to be involved? And that in a sense, they in turn are educating their parents and their extended family members who may have very little connection as right. far as open areas. That's really key, and I think uh, AWS, which has really put this all together, and uh, like I said, I'm a technical advisor, and I support them in some of the more specific technical aspects of what they do, but what they do primarily is they rally folks and, and uh, uh, to the cause of the Anacostia, and one of the best ways is engaging, uh, engaging students and young folks in that uh, in that cause and giving them outdoor experiences and bringing them to uh, give them some uh, environmental education and bringing them into because when they learn then they take it home to their uh, you know I think uh, some of us that are a little bit younger and now I'm much older now but I remember very much uh, uh, you know some of the earlier Earth days and and the importance mm -hmm. of not littering. Well, now we're beyond not littering, and I think we're beyond recycling. Um, those things just need to be a given, but we also need to be considering um, restoring ecosystems and how they are also important beyond just um, a, a luxury of restoration, but really a need for our, our, our human environment. Now, looking at the youth that are engaged in this particular project right here, I mean, this is a good example, and yeah. that's why I wanted to leave this up here. Explain a little bit about what's going on and what kind of principles uh, do you learn through through being engaged in you know, this very much hands-on kind of project or projects right. like through Boy Scouts, 4-H, uh, many uh, communities of faith will have youth right. groups that go out and involve themselves in, in nature. Right, well there's nothing better than hands-on. Um, you know, the, the, the hands-on imperative uh, is really important and I think getting people out, you can learn something in a room. Uh, or hear about uh, in a conversation, but until you actually get your hands dirty or get out and doing something good that you can feel good about, um, that's where that, that leaves an imprint and I think a marker, uh, uh, we're just predisposed to that. And so I think having more uh, folks out into the field and putting them essentially to work and volunteering, you end up getting something out of it. And I actually directly relate my uh, uh, career choices and my academic choices to uh, a very old, uh, you know, back in middle school and 
elementary school to some teachers who got us outside planting trees, um, learning about the environment with hands-on. That's really what, what got me to where I am. And if there are a number of you know, young folks or older folks that do that mm -hmm. because of what AWS does, then that's, that's all the better. Yeah, that's how I started, eight years old in 4-H, and my first two projects was forestry and conservation, mm -hmm. and then uh, probably 30 or 40 different projects mm -hmm. later, you know, when I graduated out at, at 18. Uh, meadows, this is something right. that's a really a focus as far as the song and restoring these grasslands. Right. What is a meadow? Mm -hmm. And then how does that actually enhance, improve the habitat for what's called pollinators? Mm -hmm. And what's a pollinator? Great. Well, uh, you know, there are meadows and grasslands. Some people use them interchangeably, but technically, just to set the record straight, a grassland is greater than 50% grasses, mm -hmm. and a meadow is greater than 50% forbs or herbaceous plants. Mm -hmm. So you can have those mixes either way. Um, they're both very important, and often they coexist in different uh, ways with each other. They're so important for pollinators because these are, you know, by definition, they have to be in areas where they get a lot of sunlight. And a lot of flowering plants enjoy that sunlight. And so that encourages the growth of these um, flowering plants, which attract pollinators. And what is a pollinator? A pollinator is anything that, uh, that through its gathering of, of energy, usually nectar, um, it, it, it essentially is doing the work for the plant of transferring uh, seed and, and t from, from one in sexual reproduction from one plant to another. And so it's doing the work of the plant. The plant is giving back in terms of the, the say the nectar or some of the pollen. But um, it's, it's, it's essentially tricking animals into, and you know, birds can be pollinators, insects as we think of butterflies mm -hmm. and bees. Well, even bats and, and, and others. And bats, yeah, there are many others that are. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's very interesting. But they're in the decline and it's partially a large in large part actually due to the fact of the loss of these ecosystem types due to mm -hmm. development and just succession, natural succession. A grassland or a meadow will not stay that way. It'll start to succeed into uh, shrubs and a forested unless it's managed either through fire, through lightning strike, or through human interaction. Uh, we're getting close to the end of here, but goats. How do goats, goats. fit into all this? Goats. We have some photographs of some uh, very uh, active and uh, outgoing goats here. Right. How do they fit into this whole ecosystem? And why using a, a goat? Most people think, hey, you get your lawnmower out right. or your spray or whatever it is. Yeah. Goats are great. Goats are great. Uh, you know, anybody that's uh, eaten at a Mediterranean restaurant, I can tell you, <laughs> you know what goat cheese is like. But um, uh, yeah, goats, they don't stop. They keep going, they just keep eating, and uh, they eat just about everything is, is kind of the conventional wisdom. Well, they really do do that. And so when you have invaded areas that need to be cleared, setting a, you know, a herd of goats on it is about the, the, the easiest thing you can do. You fence them off, they go to work for you. And uh, that's kind of the definition of ecological engineering is using natural mm -hmm. processes to do the work for you. Well, and also there's uh, natural droppings that they have, their hooves yes. cut into right, the soil to right. you know, conserve water and all those things. But we're out of time. Okay. What do you see for the expansion and growth as far as the Biohabitats Inc. over the next five, 10, 15 years? Oh, wow. Well, I, you know, we're, we're involved in so many things nationwide and internationally, but, um, but really when I drill back down to Anacostia and the work that we're doing, helping them uh, in terms of stormwater, managing stormwater better and creating new ecosystems in the Anacostia watershed um, of the diversity of, of ecosystems, it's really a great opportunity and there's a, a lot of work to be done. And it's just fantastic that University of Maryland really is sitting in the middle of all yes, this. It is. It's right, right there. We're willing to be in the middle. Really reach out and the students as well. Right. This is uh, Dr. Peter I. May, who is environmental scientist and a restoration ecologist of uh, Biohabitats, Inc. Thank you for being with us. Thank and you. Thank you as we create the Emerald Planet. This is firstgov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. Here's your uncle. So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty called. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log nope. on or email us like, and right. get what you need. C, change of address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. Oh. E, uh, e. Uh, emailing social security information. Ooh. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice, well allow it. Mm. Alright, eh? What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time! For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. And your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. But I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know. Not as many treats. A basic exercise plan, lots of walks and fresh air, and most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkups to help ensure the best possible quality of life. Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Good boy. Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly checkups that include preventive care and regular lab work. The message from the veterinary members of the American Animal Hospital Association. To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and the Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis, coming out of Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations. And we're looking for what we call the best of the best, the best practices that can be used, can be shared. And through the Emerald Planet TV, we're sharing, you know, four to sometimes a dozen within a week and four different shows. And so it's a way to actually share the resources that's all over the globe and need to be used because as we go to a planet that has nine billion people by 2050, maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century, that we're gonna need absolutely every type of resource possible to make this all resilient, sustainable, and we have to have as much innovation as possible. And I have a gentleman, Dr. Peter I. May, who is sitting right beside me. He's a professor at the University of Maryland. He's also an environmental scientist and restoration uh, ecologist with the Biohabitats, Inc., which is a for-profit organization, works with many uh, nonprofits and specifically with the Anacostia Watershed Society. And Peter, welcome to Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, it's good to be here. Glad to have you out with us. Looking at your professional background and skills, you know, being a professor, being an environmental uh, scientist, uh, restoration, ecology, all these various titles you have, mm -hmm. how do you fit all of that in as far as the academic world, but then bringing it into the real world, like what the Anacostia Watershed Society is faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Well, that that's really the that's really the key here, and I I, I look at uh, bridging the academic, the applied world, and my job with biohabitats, which is you know where I primarily work. I, I, they're very nice in letting me teach a class at University of Maryland uh, as, as, a, as a lecturer there, which I really enjoy. But I see my role as, a, as bridging those uh, between the advocacy groups like Anacostia Watershed Society, the academic world, and, and a lot of the great research that's going on, and then the applied world and restoration in the engineering firm that I work at. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the conservation work, uh, planning that they do, and regenerative design. So I see bridging all of those together, and that's essentially the class I teach is systems ecology. Well, there's something very special about the University of uh, Maryland. I'm a Virginia Tech grad oh. through my doctorate, so, uh, but it's a land-grant university. Yes. What is a land-grant university, and why is that special and different than just you right. know, a typical, you know, uh, research institution. Right. Well, land-grant universities really have a mandate to learn and then distribute that information out. You know, in the early days it was agriculture which really drove everything, and it still is. Um, but now there's a, a lot more new in land-grant universities in that they're learning about and then disseminating that knowledge through um, the outreach to the, uh, uh, the folks in their purview in the state of Maryland or Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, 
best practices, techniques, getting that cutting edge research out there and getting it out into the, the rest of the world. And that's, that's what really sets, I think, land grant universities apart is, is a mandate to do that and, a, and an understanding that that's what they will do. Yeah, and also they have the mandate, you know, I think it's really the only federal mandated uh, youth program, which is 4-H. True. And that is, you know, the backbone of, you know, in many ways the future the in, in all 50 states yeah. around the United exactly. States and the District of and Columbia, District which of Columbia. has its own, uh, yeah. UDC. So looking at this uh, program, which uh, you're helping with as far as the Anacostia mm -hmm. Watershed Society song, Saving Our uh, Native Grasslands, mm -hmm. which is very important. How is that uh, really uh, in a way uh, integral to what they're doing to restore the river because right. you think of grasslands and river, right. but yet you're really looking at the air, soil, and water balance mm -hmm. and the quality of that. Right. How do you do that through a special program like SONG? Well, you know, that program is getting folks out and understanding what these uh, habitats are. When we think of um, habitat restoration, we'll think of wetland restoration or forests. Really, our grasslands and our meadows haven't been paid as much attention, which I think they are starting to now, and AWS gets a lot of credit for bringing that to the fore now. Um, so those environments are very important because they're, they create, they're, by definition, when you put a grassland or a meadow up against another ecosystem, it creates edge habitat or ecotones. And those are really important because <coughs> there's an overlap of species that utilize both of those habitats. And so getting a diversity of habitats, in, especially in proximity to Anacostia River or many tributaries, um, these native ecosystems, they do things like absorb stormwater, create a diverse uh, 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 scenario for a number of species to utilize. And that diversity really, uh, uh, I think, fosters a better aesthetic, which humans tend to have. And, uh, and I think that's a positive thing. Now, looking at uh, restoration, this is something I know you're working on, the meadows uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you and I were talking a little earlier about the symbiotic relationship uh, between the meadows, the forests, mm -hmm. wetlands, uh, the urban areas, right. you know, which has uh, impacts both way. So how do you bring the most effective but also efficient way right. to blend all of those together so that you know, we're, we're not duplicating things, but right. at the same time, we're not wasting resources right. as we're moving forward to actually uh, bring back some of this uh, negative climate change that's right. going on right. and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Right, I and mean, grasslands and meadows are, are great uh, for carbon sequestration when they're mature and they're allowed it's to like function. A carbon sunk, it is right? really, yeah, carbon just you know pumps it into the ground, mm -hmm. takes it out of the atmosphere and puts it in uh, into the soil. Uh, structure. Uh, well, you know, in, in the very urban environment of the Anacostia watershed, we have areas which are, you know, mandated to be mowed. And these are perfect places to be looking at. And, and Anacostia Watershed Society is implementing uh, meadow and grassland restoration. Power line right of ways, they have to be mowed. You don't want trees growing up into the power lines. It's an ideal place because they need a meadow and a grassland needs to keep it mowed to keep the woodies out. So what a great fit to focus on developing those areas instead of just grass, mowed grass. Mm -hmm. Same thing between the levees of the northeast and northwest branches. That has to be mowed because it's, uh, we can't have trees for the, to prevent the stormwater from effectively moving during a flood event great place for grassland and meadow habitat research or uh, implementation and uh, partnering with Anacostia Watershed. Uh, you know, I hope to try to bring some of the academic and research perspective to some of their efforts, which I think makes it all a much better project. Looking at this photograph here, I've lingered on this while you're uh, giving us that very good information, but why is something, what, what are, actually, what are we looking at here? Because it looks at like a you know, degree of separation, but there's multiple things in this photograph Mm -hmm. that the untrained eye just doesn't realize. What do we see here? Well, what you see uh, in the foreground, you see are a number of forbs. These are herbaceous uh, plants uh, that, that characterize a meadow type mm -hmm. habitat. And in the background, you see a forest habitat and that edge between the two. And those two, those two ecosystems live uh, you know, side by side, create this interesting diverse habitat where a number of species, they love those edges. They like to, including a number of birds. I just saw one a, few, a month or so ago doing a bird survey on a meadow habitat restoration. Indigo bunting, if you've never seen this bird, 
It's an amazingly colorful bird. It only it needs to have trees and whatnot, but it also likes to have some open areas next to it with which to feed and then find refuge in the edge of the forest. You know, so this those is, are very important. This is something uh, also too, Peter. As far as you know, you, many times as you drive around, this is a very urbanized area as you were talking about mm -hmm. in uh, southern Maryland, uh, Nova, which is northern Virginia, mm -hmm. the suburbs there, and then Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. But you see the, the even the deer standing in the edges. Mm -hmm. You know, people think of, you know, deer want to be in the deep forest. They actually don't. They like to have, you know, this mm -hmm. diversity. So looking at the, the pollinators, the bees and the, the birds and all that, uh, the larger uh, mammals, how does this diversity and the goats, of course, we had to bring up the goats. Uh, how does this diversity really aid and, and foster a more rich and more diverse environment for everybody to live in, including humans. Right. Well, you know, you brought up deer, and again, having these edge habitats, these ecotones, does foster you have the good with the bad. Deer aren't necessarily bad, but too much of a good thing um, can be a problem. And that's something that we just have to manage and understand in that by creating these edge habitats, it's no longer a continuous eastern woodland forest. We're creating greater habitat for the deer. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, diversity is good, and diversities of ecosystems are a good thing. Yeah, looking at this too is the whole thing about you really have to work at this. You know, these things don't just happen, particularly when you have the, the density of population. And of course, when we think of density, you think of a, a New Delhi in India or Beijing, uh, China, right. or, uh, you know, Sao Paulo and down yeah, in Brazil. We have no idea of density compared to those right. cities. But yet at the same time, this just doesn't happen on its own. And you have to really work at it. Yeah. And that's where you come in, right. Peter, this plan. How do you plan to make all of this fit? Well, it's, it's, it's really about understanding your ecosystems and how they all fit together. That's, you know, the class I teach is ecosystem ecology. Some people think that's a redundancy, but it's really how different ecosystems uh, interact and then how the human uh, element interacts with those ecosystems. So knowing the elements and what they do and how to put them together and then how to kick them off into, the, into a good direction for the future, but they are managed. Meadow and grassland habitats have to be managed. That's why in a cost watershed society, you need need a steward. They are the steward for these new ecosystems that will need to be managed in perpetuity. You got to have somebody looking after what, what you've done or else all that work would be for naught. They're the ones that are doing it. Yeah, and we're seeing people here doing that and we're just about out of time. What are some of the best practices that we're learning through all of this, the work that you're doing right. as a for-profit, your work at the university and also with the nonprofit, the Anacostia right. Watershed Society, that really not only hits us domestic but can right. be shared internationally. Well, we got to be quick. Really quick, I think some of the most interesting things, you need big areas for grasslands and meadows, but you can do them on, mic on micro scales. And right here in Prince George's County, where Anacostia Watershed Society is, the rain garden was first developed. It's basically a small micro version of a, uh, of a wet meadow mm -hmm. and the kinds of species that you plant in those. So those can be wedged into small areas in the urban fabric, and they also manage and help to deal with stormwater at the same time. So using what we know about ecosystems and if you have to make them smaller and put them into a tight spot in order to get that function and that benefit from them, but also for the, the benefit of the species that utilize them. So pulling it all together, uh, really finding ways to use ecosystems to help us in the We're out of time. I'm going to leave this up because this is a rain garden. What do you see for the expansion and growth of the work that you're doing over the next 5, 10, 15 years? I, Gotta be quick. Yeah, I'd love to be more involved and uh, get to some of these unique species like the Baltimore checker spot and its symbiotic relationship with the white turtle head in wet meadow environments in Anacostia watershed. Rare species globally, I'd like to work more with those. We're glad you brought that up. Thank you for remembering yeah. to do that. This is Dr. Peter I. May, environmental scientist, restoration ecologist, biohabitats. Thank you for being with us as we're talking about how do we restore the environment, claw back climate change as we create emerald planet. Thank you.